Fighting between armed groups in Tripoli puts Libya's security in the spotlight once again. They say they won't lay down their weapons as long as there's no national army or security force. But the interim government can't do that as long as the militias are still running free. The future of Libyan security after Gaddafi and the fears of a civil war. This is Inside Story. Welcome to the program. I'm Hazem Seeker. On Tuesday, fierce fighting erupted in Libya's capital between militias from Tripoli and the city of Misrata. At least four fighters were killed and five others injured. A member of the Tripoli Military Council said the arrest of a Misrata fighter in Tripoli triggered the clashes, while a Libyan official provided a different account of what caused the fighting, saying that the clashes were over control of a building that previously housed an intelligence center under former Libyan leader Muammar Gaddafi. Observers say just Disbanding disparate armed groups of former revolutionary fighters is one of the most serious and immediate problems facing Libya's new leadership. Meanwhile, the country's interim government has named Yusuf in Mankush, a retired general from the anti-Gaddafi bastion of Misrata, as head of the armed forces. It's the first significant move to build a new Libyan military, and we'll be looking at what that means for the country's future. More than two months after Gaddafi was captured and killed, the real power remains in the hands of the militias across the country. Today's fighting was not the first of its kind. In November, dozens of fighters clashed at a Tripoli hospital in what residents said was the biggest armed confrontation in the city since the war ended. In December, Abdurrahim El Kaib, the head of Libya's interim government, held a meeting on the infighting. He said... Since the liberation of Tripoli, the government has engaged in a multi-phased process to encourage militias to either leave the city or integrate into official military or law enforcement bodies. A number of recommendations have been proposed to end the armed group's presence in the cities. They include integrating militias within a central armed force or central security administration, as we mentioned, taking control of stolen weapons stockpiles, buying back weapons from the militias, whether by the central government or the U.S. military. In addition to these points, the International Crisis Group recommends that the legitimacy of central authorities should be strengthened by ensuring greater transparency in decision-making. It also recommends all these decisions are taken in close consultation with local military councils, militias and religious leaders. The new Libyan army chief, Yusuf Manghouche, has said that the army he is looking for is one focused on quality rather than numbers. We are trying to organize the army. The defense ministry and the chief of staff are now one body. We have a two-pronged strategy. We're looking to form an army that focuses on quality, not quantity. Secondly, we also need to protect our borders and sensitive locations. So how difficult is the challenge and how can the Libyan government end the armed group's presence on the streets? Well, joining us to answer these questions are our guests in London. Daniel Korski, Senior Policy Fellow at the European Council on Foreign Relations. In Tunis, Wahid Bouchan, he is a member of the National Transitional Council and part of the stabilization team. And joining us from Cairo, retired General Sameh Saif El Yazal, who is the director of the Egyptian Institute for Strategic Studies and an expert on national security and intelligence intelligence issues. Welcome, gentlemen. Um, Wahid Bouchan, if I could start with you, what is the biggest priority for you at this point? How does the National Transitional Council in Libya plan to disarm these uh, militias and integrate them into a national army? Obviously, the, the most important thing is that, that they have a clear objectives. And I think uh, from uh, Mr. Mangouche, uh, I think he, ha he has, has definitely uh, looks like he has a, a clear uh, objectives which is uh, uh, and, and, and incorporate uh, these uh, revolutionary youth into the military and organize the military on a professional manner. Um, having this uh, statement uh, uh, very, very clear, I think it's, it's an excellent start. Um, also, I know that they are looking to have assistance uh, from international community uh, into um, sort of like uh, disarmament uh, program of the of the youth or the militia if you will um, and incorporate them into into the military 
um, having these program, um, I think they are, uh, um, will be effective. I think they uh, will uh, shorten the time of uh, putting uh, the National Army into place. Uh, having the National Army is of the utmost importance for stabilizing the country and reconstitute uh, the state uh, in uh, the future Libya. Daniel Korski, does it surprise you that there is still a, a great amount of instability in Tripoli right now, two months uh, after the, or several months rather, after the fall of Gaddafi? It doesn't surprise me. I mean, any kind of revolutionary uh, upheaval brings with it chaos and, and conflict. Uh, and now a number of armed groups that fought bravely and heavily uh, in order to get rid of the Khalafi regime um, obviously are reluctant to give, all, give over their weapons uh, in exchange for an uncertain future. Uh, but the really a key point here uh, is that the Libyan authorities must develop uh, not just a vision for the armed forces, as the new um, minister has suggested, a new, a new army chief has suggested, but a vision for the entire country. Because at the end of the day, um, it isn't really just a technical process of, of military reform that transforms militias into a, a standing national uh, army. It's really a, a commitment to a broader vision for what the country is about, the kind of transition process it wants to go through, and what role the military plays in that. So, so in many ways, uh, a bid on professional uh, professionalization of the armed forces is important, but so is, is progressing that broader vision of Libya's future. Uh, General Samah uh, Sayafil Yazal, as a military man yourself, can you see the potential here for a, a viable and effective army taking shape in Libya? Uh, absolutely, yes. Um, I can see that the main issue right now is uh, lacking of a leadership. Uh, the, we have to have uh, an immediate uh, army leadership uh, actually respected and implemented right away. Uh, and it ha they have to respect the, the, this, that leadership, not only like, like that, but also to start a dialogue between the militia group leaders as well as the political groups and that, that leadership in order to come with a real uh, constructive, uh, I would say, terms and agreement that they have to uh, uh, come with uh, a strategic uh, points and ideas to form the new army and the new uh, police uh, forces, as well as uh, everybody uh, wants to be participated to the, uh, the intelligence and security organizations in Libya. So the point is, uh, all the militia groups and the political groups, they believe that they are the cause and reason for the victory of, of that revolution. So uh, everyone wants to have a big, big piece of the cake, uh, and that actually is not really uh, on the right direction of uh, the future of Libya. Uh, uh, having said that, it's not uh, at the end of the road, but uh, I believe we still have a hope before having a civil war that they have to start that dialogue immediately in order to get stability uh, to that country. Yeah, let's put some of that to uh, Wahid uh, Boshan. I mean, a big reason that so many of these uh, militia groups are holding on to their weapons is that they simply don't trust the interim government right now. They see their weapons as um, the guarantors of the revolution, and they don't want to see the fruits of that revolution. They, they want to see the fruits of that revolution, rather, before they give up uh, their weapons. So what is the government doing right now to address those concerns? Well, for, first of all, uh, let me clarify something. Uh, in terms of the vision of the future of Libya, I think clearly is in place. I don't think we, we have an issue there. The, the, the difficulty we have is that in the interim, the state is weak. Still, we don't have uh, really uh, people in charge or the systems in charge in order to execute such visions. And uh, the bigger obstacle uh, is the military and the security. So once we have this going, I think everything else hopefully will fall into a place. In terms of the idea or a mention of civil war, that's no, nothing of the sort. There's no such thing. The, n none of these things have even a notion of it. Um, we went through uh, a stage where Gaddafi is trying to divide us, and we, we successfully have overcome such, a, such an environment. What we have is that uh, it's true, though, uh, is that uh, people have still, still a sense of insecurity just because the fact that the state is, have not uh, strengthened itself. And I think this is something very natural. Uh, before I give my own uh, uh, individual security or my family to, to, uh, to the state, I want to make sure that the state is in place. I think that's what's happening. Um, people are just sort of like uh, protecting their homes. One statement, uh, just to clarify the environment, one statement my sister was mentioning to me, that uh, there's, a, there's a, 
uh, a misstatement was stated uh, earlier with people that we had security in Gaddafi's time. We never did. What we did was each one, uh, each one of us was were protecting each other. Uh, the, the, the old regime was protecting itself. So that environment has really passed on to the current environment, and people sort of like uh, protecting their neighborhoods, protecting their homes, their tribes, and they're waiting for the state to constitute itself. Once that's in place, naturally, people will uh, go to their livelihood, to their normal, normal life, they will surrender their weapons, and I think that's just a state, uh, sort of like a, a caution uh, position. Uh, oh. the, the, one of the one of the grievances, Mr. Bushan, that uh, many of these uh, militia fighters have is that they say uh, that a greater priority should have been given to those who did the fighting, namely themselves, and they won't hand over their weapons until um, after the elections. Now we know, on based on the current ta timetable, that that won't be until at least six months from now. Uh, I would say even more, uh, I, and, and I think that's the statement. That's an accurate. Uh uh, fact that the uh, the revolutionaries or the youth have made that declaration. What's what, what the worrisome thing or what they're worried about is that they fear that the uh, the the old regime or individuals of the old regime or some kind of uh, sort of like uh, uh, a new system might take on or take advantage of the vacuum and uh, would not be uh, democratic or representative of the new Libya. And I think that's a healthy uh, proposition. What's the fear? It's not having armament and people trying to make sure that the revolution is in the right path. The fear is the misuse of the the, uh, the current environment and uh, use it uh, into sort of like uh, uh, you know for stealing things or uh, taking on other issues that's uh, that's not uh, positive. So uh, what's important right now is for the state to reconstitute itself very very uh, fast. Um, and, and once that's happened, uh, people trust the system, they will surrender uh, their armament, and there will not be any difficulties there. Daniel, Daniel Korski, there's something of a, of a catch-22 uh, type situation going on here, isn't there? Because on the one hand, you have these militias saying, uh, we can't give up control because the national uh, authorities uh, can't do it on their own, but the national authorities won't be able to consolidate any security as long as you have these militias running around. Exactly. This is a classical post-conflict chicken and egg situation. We all know that the state needs to have a monopoly on the use of violence, but isn't currently able to grasp that for itself. And in many other cases, what we've seen is um, the important role of, of internationals, um, whether from the UN or from the EU or the African Union, um, who have been able to come in and, in a sense, try to bridge the, the gap, provide uh, assurances, guarantees, and, of course, also external assistance in order to facilitate some kind a process of, of demobilization and integration that allows for the creation of a, of a stronger and more effective state. Um, in the past, the Libyans have been a little more uh, hesitant uh, at accepting a large-scale international presence. I think in itself that has been a, a very positive development. But, but now um, we're seeing, I think, signs that they're willing to accept a more, more international advice and, 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 and assistance, and I think that, that can prove crucial. Uh, the other point to make is, is right now we're talking a lot about the military, uh, and that's natural in the aftermath of a, of a military conflict, but this really is about constituting a, a much broader security apparatus where the role of the military is fundamentally different from the kind of services that a police must provide to its citizens. Uh, and it's very important uh, as this process of security uh, reform gets underway, uh, that there becomes a sort of uh, a clearer division of responsibilities. Because the one thing that, that the Qaddafi regime, um, you know, continued was, was the use of, of various different kind of shadowy um, security or organizations to clamp down on, on, on ordinary Libyans. And I think the future for Libya must hold a, a clearer division of responsibilities between what the army does and what the police services uh, do uh, and so on. Uh, General uh, Saif al yazal if I could uh, turn back to you on this. In Egypt, of course, uh, the army has always been a very strong institution, and that's partly why they are now the de facto rulers there. But despite all of the recent tensions there, the army still commands uh, a great deal of admiration uh, and respect in Egyptian society. But in, in Libya, of course, under Gaddafi, you never had that. So you are essentially uh, building an army from the, from the ground up. How hard is that going to be? 
It's going to be very difficult. But let me comment first for the idea of not having a possibility of civil war in Libya. I think uh, I just want to comment that uh, Abdel Galil himself said that yesterday. He said that he is very afraid that uh, the uh, the country will go through a civil uh, war uh, uh, soon if if the the conflict will not be resolved uh, as soon as possible. So uh, I'm just commenting again about the the leader of Libya. He said that. So from my point of view, yes, we can face a civil war over there, and uh, I'm afraid that uh, that can go even farther. Than that, that a split of two Libyas, uh, to two countries, could be uh, uh, one of the scenarios. Unfortunately, I hope, hopefully not. But back again to your point. Yes, uh, the idea of, of forming uh, a, a, an army uh, from scratch uh, in Libya is essential. Uh, right now, as you know, the infrastructure completely is destroyed uh, by NATO and, uh, and during the war. So we need to start from scratch. We need to start from square one. Uh, that is not a, a big deal uh, for financially, because Libya has the financial resources of that, uh, by, for, of course, by the petrol and gas. But the, the point is this is going to take some time. I'm sure the Americans and the Europeans will, will help that uh, a lot, and they will give them uh, what they want. Uh, uh, and the point is, is to come first with who is going to run the army. You have to have the right people to, uh, for the leadership and the forces as well. So you have to make everybody happy. You have to satisfy all the militia groups and the political groups by, uh, <coughs> excuse me, by having uh, members of them in, in every level, in the commanding level and the other levels as well. So the point is to come again with an agreement, how to satisfy everybody. This is going to be a, 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 a difficult job. It's not going to be an easier run from my point of view. Uh, the, the idea of buying the weapons from uh, the militia, as, they, dis as they, uh, they discussed it, or at least uh, the idea came a few days ago, that uh, in order to get uh, rid of the problem is to buy the weapons from them. This, I've never heard about this before. This is one of a kind issue, which we never seen before. Could be one of the solutions, but anyway, it's not going to be easy to do it. The, the problem is to have an agreement between everybody to know exactly what they want to do uh, to build that army. Uh, Wahid Bushan, are you confident that you're getting enough uh, assistance from, from the international uh, community in all this? Because, of course, you have, you have the oil uh, revenues, but that has its own uh, drawbacks. You need also, as well, uh, technical assistance from outside Libya. Are you getting that? Yeah, I think we are uh, getting... Uh, <laughs> We are getting that. Uh, what I'm trying, uh, I'm pausing here a little bit just because sometimes the assistance is not coming to relevancy to what we need on the ground. Um, I, what's, uh, I, I think at this stage it's important that our programs um, be designed or understood in light of our culture um, uh, and the way that our society is structured. Uh, one of the, the dangers of programs, uh, such as, for example, the gentleman from Egypt mentioned the buying programs. He is absolutely correct. That's one of the programs being uh, addressed. But I must say, uh, th I would suggest that uh, some, sometimes these programs create other things. You, you don't want to buy weaponry, for example, where a lot of it is still with uh, the old military regimes. Uh, what you do is that you probably indirectly financing groups you're not aware of. So throwing money at, uh, uh, at, uh, to resolve security issues is, is not a very good idea. What's important here, I think the gentleman from London mentioned that, I think we need to have uh, an overall strategy. And I think these strategies are already in place. I'm very familiar with them. One of them is the pioneering programs, but it's in light of a lot of, a lot of other things that need to take place in order for these programs to be successful. Um, it's very, very important um, uh, no, uh, trying to resolve uh, issues uh, in, in a narrow way uh, might not be the best way to do things. It has to be comprehensive. It has to be in light of a lot of other social, economical um, uh, programs in place where all of these things in, in a concise and consistent way come together hopefully to overcome the catch-22 that you earlier mentioned, which is true at this point, uh, that uh, hopefully the government will be successful at. Um, Daniel Korski, I know that um, previously you served as, a, a, as an advisor on, on reconstruction efforts in Iraq. What comparisons can you draw uh, from that that uh, might be pertinent here as far as, as uh, rebuilding Libya? I think we have to be very careful about drawing um, comparisons, and I think the Libyans themselves would be um, aghast at the idea that we would be transferring lessons from one to the other. Um, that said, there are a number of challenges that run through not just the, the experience in Iraq, but also uh, in Bosnia, in Kosovo, uh, and of course uh, Afghanistan. 
Um, and, and it really goes to the heart of, of seeing security issues as a very broad uh, kind of challenge. So isn't, it isn't simply one that is solved by disarming a certain group and building a Ministry of Defense and agreeing on a, on a strategy. It's really about um, looking at the economic opportunities for those who've had to lay down their arms, um, the way in which they are drawn into a, a political process, how are they actually going to be represented in future, um, how do you ensure that, that if they give up the kind of power that they have through um, through their weaponry now that they in future don't feel the need to to find new arms because they aren't engaged in the in the political process uh, and that requires as the international crisis group has said greater transparency it requires um, resolution of some of the outstanding issues that that still um, circle the the draft electoral law um, and what we're seeing for example in in, in comparison to, to Egypt um, how dangerous it is it it is for a transition if there isn't a broad agreement on the kind of steps that need to be taken in order to constitute political authorities and therefore for these authorities to give power to, to security actors. So those are some of the, the broader lessons, not just from Iraq, but from a range of, of transition experiences. Uh, General uh, Saif El Yazal, if I could turn back to you on this, I want to talk a little bit about uh, the new man that's that's named uh, to head up the, the uh, Libyan military, uh, Yusuf El Mankush. He's a retired general from this uh, uh, anti-Gaddafi bastion of Misrata. Uh, as far as his credentials, that has to count for a lot among among the militias, doesn't it? Because he's he's someone who's who who was in this conflict, uh, was was there as a as a prisoner, um, and that has to count a lot in terms of credibility with 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 people there. Uh, yes, I believe uh, he will be uh, respected from uh, many of the uh, militia groups and political groups. Uh, uh, as you know, he was vice uh, minister of defense until being appointed as uh, chief of staff uh, recently, yesterday. And uh, uh, his history is, is a very clear history. Uh, he was supporting very much the youth revolutionary and as well as the uh, demonstrations and protesters in Libya until he started to be one of them. Uh, and he's been arrested, as you mentioned. Uh, I think, again, he's from Misrata, and Misrata is respected, uh, very much respected as well. And they played a big role in that revolution. So I don't think there is any conflict uh, uh, about appointing him at all uh, as chief of staff and, and head of the, uh, the army. Uh, the idea is uh, to get uh, the second level of commanding uh, from the other militia groups and political groups to satisfy everybody. Uh, and this is going to be, uh, uh, I think, it's going to take some time. It's going to be a difficult job to do to, to satisfy everybody and to make them happy. Wahid Burshan, are you um, confident that this is the man for the job? Yes, he comes uh, uh, very well uh, um, uh, recommended, and, and uh, you're absolutely correct. He is a definitely respected individual. Um, we feel that he's the, the man for the job. I think uh, what's important, though, is trying to de-emphasize the regional, where he comes from, Musrata, or so on. I think that's, uh, that hopefully we can overcome such a regionality uh, or such an approach. I think what's important, uh, and he declared this, this is that uh, he will help uh, build an army that is professional, that is loyalty to the state and to the constitution, like any other modern society nothing to individuality or uh, built into grouping or regional aspirations. I think we, uh, hopefully we can, uh, and I'm sure we will do that. Uh, we are uh, not Afghanistan or Iraq or anything like that. Our society is really simple, and I really must stress that. Sometimes it looks, uh, you know, kind of scary, but our people are really uh, uh, peaceful, loving people. Uh, with all the bloodshed that you've seen, they're not really uh, prone to violence. Just uh, uh, they came through an experience with the tyrant that they have a lot of uh, uh, insecurity or an anxiety of insecurity. Once that's subsided and once the state is strong, they will go back to their life and they will uh, uh, clearly uh, will have a much, much peace peaceful life. They have l much much more to look forward to in their future than the current environment. So they're not going to basically uh, look into uh, wh what's happening now. They're looking forward to uh, prosperous new Libya, hopefully, right. in the near final, future. Final word to you then, uh, Daniel Korski. Uh, are you confident that, uh, as far as how all of this will play out, that things will eventually get better in Libya? 
I'm fairly confident Libya is a rich country. Uh, it is far more unified in its um, sense of national identity than it's often given credit for. The conflict, though uh, it cost lives, was not a, as drawn out as many others we've seen, and there isn't this sort of desire for incredible bloodletting. Um, and, and there's an enormous international goodwill towards uh, towards Libya and its, uh, and its reconstruction challenges. All right, and on that note, we will leave it. Uh, my thanks to all three of our guests, Daniel Korski, Wahid Boshan, and retired General Samih Saif Ilyazel. Many thanks for your time, gentlemen. And that's it for this edition of Inside Story. Remember, if you want to send us your feedback, just email your thoughts to us at insidestory at aljazeera.net. I'm Hazem Seeker. Thanks for watching. Latest news is up next. We'll see you next time.